Digital Education Zone and today I will be giving you a complete guide to your JAM or UTM in Mathematics for the year 2022. So without wasting much of our time, let's delve into the business. Now first of all, your um, Mathematics exam is going to consist of several sections and I will be addressing each of the sections today and I'll be talking about the various parts of the sections. So the first section we'll talk about is number and basic arithmetic operations. Now for the number and basic arithmetic operations, I will, I will um, write the um, topics in the description of this video. I will write the topics in the description of this video. So you will see the topics in the description but let me talk about the... For number and numeration, you will talk about number based conversions. So a number base is basically a um, a base where you calculate. We have base two, base three, base four, base five, base six, base seven, base eight, base nine, and base ten, and so on and so forth. And then all those bases you might be asked to convert from one base to another. So when converting from one base to another, you you, you need to know that you need to express and expand those bases. For example, when when I, if if we ask to convert one three to base four. First of all, if we have to expand, you have to expand this base, you expand it in terms of the powers. So you talk about then you 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 give this one a um a um a high um a, a, a place value of zero, you give the three a value of one, you give the one a value of two. So you begin to expand. So you say one times then what's the value above? That's one times four, the base is four is one times four. Then your base raised to the, the value above. 1 times 4 is about 2. Put it in bracket. Then plus 3 times 4. So you keep multiplying by the base. And you raise the base to the power of the um, place. Of the place value of it. So 3 times 4 is about 1. Then plus 2 times 4 is about 0. So these are your expand bases. And then if you have further have to convert from, an, from this base to another base. Then you now simplify your expansion. So you say 1 times 4 is power 2 is 16, I mean, that's 1 times 16 is 16. 3 times 4 is power 1, that's 3 times 4, that's 12 plus 12, plus 2 times 4 is power 0 is 1, that's 2. So in total you have um, 30. And then so far we have converted this to base 10. So any base you are converting, just multiply by the base, just multiply the digits by the base and raise the base to the power of the place of that digit. So you multiply the digits by the base and raise the base to the power of that digit. Then, imagine we have to convert and imagine we have to determine an unknown base. So if you have to determine an unknown base, maybe you have something like um one um x one three two base x is equal to thirty base ten. Now in this question we have to look for the base. Now you still follow this method. You multiply both um you multiply the left hand side each of the, the digits by the that unknown base. So you assume the base is known and then you multiply by that x. So that x can be anything. So that one, one times x raised power. So you have zero one two on top. Raised power two plus three times x raised power one plus two times x raised power zero is equals to 30. So then we have x square plus 3x plus 2 is equals to 30. Then once again we have um, x square plus 3x. Then moving the 30 to the, to the left hand side we have minus 28 plus 0. Then we have a uh, one factor we have x square plus 7x minus 4x minus 28 so this is actually a method of factorization so we have them um, so one factorize this one factorize x out x plus 7 put a bracket then open minus 4 minus 4 then minus 4 out of x is x minus 28 divided by minus 4 that's plus 7 plus 0 so now let's factorize what's common to them x plus 7 x plus 7 x plus 7, you divide this by x plus 7, you will be left with um, x. Divide the second one by x plus 7, you will be left with minus 4. This plus 7. So x plus 7 or x minus 4 is equal to 0. So that means x is what? Minus 7 or x is 4. 
Now note that the base of a number can never be negative. That means in this question, your answer is automatically positive. So next, we're talking about ratio, proportions, and averages. So a ratio is basically a number above in respect to another number below. Now, whenever you ask to convert, you ask to find the ratio of a number to another number. So you basically you can basically cross multiply. That's if it's in form of a fraction, and even if it's in form of ratio, if it's a ratio, you convert to a fraction. If you say three ratio five, that is three over five in fraction. So when you want to perform operations on ratios and fractions, you convert the ratio to fractions in order to cross multiply. Then it's common in jam for them to give you um, three ratios. We'll talk about that. So then we have um, simple interest and compound interest. The formula for simple interest is um, simple interest SI for short is equal to principal times time times rate over 100. And then your compound interest is equal to your P, open bracket, 1 plus R over 100 raised to power your N. Now in this, in this equation, your P is your principal. That's the amount of money you are saving. Your time is your um, the, 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 the duration of your saving. And then your rate is your um, the interest in interest rates. That's the amount, percentage of your principal, which rises per year. Then your N is the number of years, as I said earlier. So basically, that is all on. Then next, we'll talk about ratio and proportion. There's a part of ratio and proportion you might be given in jam. You might be asked to you might be asked of ratio A ratio B. A ratio B. Imagine if A ratio B is 3 ratio 5. And then B ratio C is. Um, let's, let's assume B ratio C is um, 2 ratio C. It's um, 2 ratio 6. Or let's, let's say 1 ratio. Uh, yes. 2 ratio 6. Now, if, 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 if you are given a ratio, a ratio B is 3 ratio 5 and B ratio C is 2 ratio 6, then what is A ratio B ratio C? A ratio B ratio C. Now, this is a common ratio question. Now, the best thing you need to do is you need to look for what you multiply by um, your. You need to look for a number that will make this equal. What will you multiply with this? Or basically, you just look for the. Um, the uh, a number that's multiply two by five and multiply by five by two. So you, you multiply each by a different number that will make them equal. So if I want to make them equal, I want to make each of them ten. Now I'll multiply the five by two, and then that will give me ten. I'll multiply the two by five to give me ten. So if I multiply five by two, I will multiply this whole ratio by two. And if I multiply the two by five, I will multiply this whole ratio by five. That becomes a ratio b. Is, a ratio b becomes. That's um, 2 ratio 5 times 2, that's 3 times 2, that's 6 ratio, 5 times 2, that's 10. Then B ratio C becomes 2 times 5, that's 10 ratio, 6 times 5, that's 30. So if I combine everything together, I will get A ratio B ratio C is equal to 6 ratio 10 ratio 30. So the, I have taken advantage of the fact that this your B is, your B is equal to B, right? So in... If, if if you have a letter A is equal to A, B is equal to B, that's the identity rule. And so if your B in the first equation, is, in the first ratio is equal to your B in the second ratio, if you can make them equal, then you can be able to find the easily find A ratio, B ratio, C. Then indices, logarithm, and sort. We have laws of indices, standard forms, and logarithm. The law of indices are the, um, whenever you have um, powers, whenever you, you multiply, you, you multiply powers, you add them. So if if you have a raised power, if you have x raised power a times x raised power b, that will be x raised power a plus b. So and then if you divide powers, you subtract them. That's x raised power a minus x raised power b because of x raised power a minus b. And then if you raise a power to another power, you multiply it. So basically, like x raised power a raised to power b is equal to x raised power a times b. That's x raised power a b. So now those are the three basic um, rules of sorts. There are still more, but something like if we have um, um majorly the remaining rules of sort are gotten from this rule of sort. So these three major rules of sort 
True. If you don't know any other, you must know them because mm -hmm. you can easily mm -hmm. derive the rest yeah, from them. The then you have logarithm. Mm -hmm. If you have yeah. a number of logarithm, maybe you have if the logarithm of number is three point four two six one from your logarithm mm -hmm. table. Mm -hmm. This is called the characteristics. The number before the decimal point is characteristics. Then the number after the decimal point is called the mantissa. So that's basically what you need to know for logarithm. And then when you multiply numbers, you add their logarithm. Then when you divide numbers, you subtract their logarithm. So that is for logarithm. Then next, we'll talk about sets and Venn diagram. Set terminology, Venn diagram, and all the rest. Now, set, the union of a set is the part of it, it is the part that forms the middle of the set. Now, if you have these two sets, the union of this set is the everything contained in this region. That is everything. When you hash that, when you hash everything of the set, including the union. So the union of the set is the addition of what is in one of them, what is in both of them, and what is in the other. So what is in one of them, and what is in both of them. But the intersection of a set is only what is in both of them. Intersection of set is only what they have in common. So union of sets and intersection of sets are very are very important for you to know. Then we have um, complements of sets. The complement of a set is the um, is another set that contains part what is not contained in the set. So the complement of a set is more like the opposite of a set. If this is my set, if I share this region and this shaded region is my set, then any region that is outside the shaded region is shaded region is known as the complement of the set. Now, Venn diagrams. Venn diagrams are used to um, represent information on sets. So basically, you have a Venn diagram in, in which one um, part. You have a rectangle, and inside the rectangle you have space, and then whatever is in the rectangle is called your, um, it's called your universal set. So those ele elements inside the rectangle, they are called the elements of the universal set, and whatever set inside the re universal set is known as the subset of the universal set. Now, if a set is contained in another set, it's called a subset. That is, if everything in a set is contained in another set, it's called a subset. But if a set Okay, if, if, a, if a set is as if a set contains another set, it's called the superset of that set. So the subset is basically like the set that contains that that is con that contains a set, and then the superset is the set that contains another set. So in simple terms, a subset is gotten from a superset, and a superset contains a subset. Now, next we we'll talk about in Venn diagrams. We will have um various intuitive methods for solving them which you can easily look up and by knowing the um, simple um, definition of Venn diagram you can easily add and subtract your areas now algebraic expression is the next topic we will be covering for your jam and then you need to understand how to add subtract divide and multiply polynomials and then we'll talk about that when you're adding polynomials imagine you have a polynomial x squared plus x cubed. If this is a polynomial a and then you are adding into another polynomial b which is x plus so, then basically you just add the terms and any term that has the same power can be added directly but any term that any term that does not have the same power cannot be added directly imagine if we change this to x squared then we will open the brackets now now then that means this x squared plus x squared will be 2x squared plus x cubed Plus two. So now in mathematics, you cannot add x squared plus x cubed. You cannot say x squared plus x cubed is two x x squared because any power, any any term of an unknown that does not have the same power cannot be added. But you can add x squared to x squared to get two x squared. But you cannot add x squared to x cubed to get two x cubed. So always note that. Don't make those sorts of mistakes. Then when you are subtracting polynomials. Always make sure that your subtraction affects every term in your bracket. Now if this was subtraction here. Imagine to subtraction, then every term inside the bracket will be multiplied by your, by your minus. And always remember that your minus times your plus is minus, and your plus times your minus is minus. Then your plus times plus is plus, and then your minus times minus is plus. So basically, every term in your, in your bracket will take that minus. So this will become this is minus times x squared, that's minus x squared, minus times 2, that's minus 2. So that means your, your x squared will cancel your x squared in this case. Then you'll be left with x cubed minus 2. So... Addition and subtraction of polynomials are simple and um, intuitive. The next, we'll talk about multiplication of polynomials. So basically, multiplication of polynomials is just like multiplication of algebraic expressions. Imagine this is a times. 
So you take one one term of the first polynomial and multiply with every remaining term of the second polynomial. So this x squared times x squared is x is power four. X squared times two is is two x squared plus two x squared. Then you now take the second term. When you are finished using the first term to multiply everything, you take the second term. Now x cubed times x squared is what? That then from the first law of um, indices, you are, when you have a, a, a multiplication of powers, you add their powers. When you have a multiplication of powers, you add the powers above. So x is for a times x is for b will be equal to x is for a plus b. So that means x is for 4, x is for 3 times x is for 2 will become x is for 3 plus 2. That's x is for 5. Then we have x is for 3 times 2 is what? 2x is for 3. So then, you can see that the law of indices also apply here. Next, we talk about the remainder and factor theorems. Remainder theorems is the theorem that says that whenever you um, sub substitute, whenever you divide a polynomial by another no, another um, polynomial, if you equate the if you equate the dividing polynomial to zero, and you substitute your result, that your answer will become the remainder. Now, let me perform an operation of division of polynomial. Imagine I wanted to divide x squared x cube plus x squared plus x. Imagine I wanted to divide by x plus plus one, or rather x minus one. Now, if you want to divide polynomials, you take the first the first um, power, the first power of x, or rather the highest power of x of the what you want to divide. Now, we want to divide this one. You take the first power of what you want to divide. Now you take the first part of what is dividing. Now I'll take the power of x here and power of x cubed. Now I'll say x cubed divided by x is what? x squared. I'll write it on top as my result. Then I'll now multiply again. x, x, um, x cubed, x times x squared is x cubed. Then minus 1 times x is minus x squared. Minus 1 times x squared is minus x squared. So then you subtract this from the, the top. Just like uh, a normal division. So x cubed minus x cubed is, is 0. Then x squared plus x squared, that's 2x squared. Then again, we divide again. So x minus 2x squared, that's 2x. So x plus 2x. Then you now multiply it by, the, by your quotient. x times um, 2x, that's um, 2x squared. So we bring the x down, plus x. x times 2x is 2x squared. Minus 2x. So then we we'll subtract again from the top. 2x minus 2x, so that's 0. Then x plus 2x, so that's 2x. x plus x plus 2x, that's 3x. So you can see that you can keep dividing until we get a result. Now, what you get at your final answer is called your, um, your remainder. And then you can easily get your remainder from your factor theorem. Now, let me divide to the last. X is 3x, that's plus 3. X times 3 is 3x. Minus 1 times 3 is minus 3. So when I divide, when I 3x minus 3x is 0. Minus 3 minus, minus times minus 3 is 3. So you can see that my remainder from this equation here is 3. Now, if you make use of the remainder theorem, you substitute the value of x when your, um, your what is dividing. When you are the, when, when what you are using to the, the, the dividing polynomial, when you sub, substitute to zero, what you get as your answer is called your remainder, and that is your remainder theorem. And when your remainder is zero, it's called a factor. Now, if I substitute x, if I if I make x minus one equals to zero, and I substitute x, I move the minus one to the other side, it becomes plus one. That's x plus plus one. Then my um, if I substitute one in my equation, I will have um. Well, we have, um, yes, so I'll have x squared, I'll make it 1, 1 plus 2x plus 2 times 1 plus 3. That's 1 plus 2 plus 3. 1 plus 2, that's 3 plus 3, that's 6. So as, as, as such, my remainder here is 6. My remainder here is 6. So, sorry, I mean, you substitute in the original equation, sorry. So then, we have um, x cubed, that is, um, x cubed, that is, 1 is for 3 is 1, 1 is for 3 is 2, 1, 1 plus 1 plus, 1, that's 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1, that's 3. So you can see that my remainder is equal to, either, it doesn't matter the method you use, your remainder will still be the same. So then, we have to talk about um, algebraic expressions, we have to talk about factor theorems and all the rest. So, let's talk about change of subject or formula. 
change your solid to form that involves removing every coefficient of your of your needed term and then you um you make it the subject so basically that is a secondary school work and it's very easy just if you if you add in, if you have any term beside your your um, your subject the what you want to make a subject you remove the term by algebraic operations such as minus subtract addition and, and division let me give an example So imagine we have something like um three x y plus two z equals to three e. Now you have to make um you have to make y your subject. So basically, you look for the terms having y. Imagine if there's another y here plus two y. So you collect the terms collect containing your subject together. Now my subject is y. I want to make y my subject. So I'll collect any term having y to the left hand side or right hand side. Either one you choose. Now I'll move this two y to the other side. That's three xy. So when I move two y to the other side, it becomes minus two y. So I three x y minus two y is equal to. Then I move this the terms not containing y to the opposite side. So I move this z to the other side. It's like a residual. Three e minus two z. Then I will now factorize my y out, my subjects out. So I will factorize y, oh, bring y out. When you divide 3xy by y, you get 3x. Then you put your minus at the middle. When you divide 2y by y, when you divide minus 2y by y, it comes a minus 2, minus 2. This is equal to 3e e plus 2z. Now you look at what is connecting your y to your um, coefficient. Now the coefficient of y in this equation is 3x minus, minus um, 2. Now, 3x minus 2 is being multiplied to y. So then to eliminate multiplication, you have to divide. So you have to divide both sides by this so equation. 3x minus 2. Divide by 3x minus 2. So that means my y becomes 3e minus 2z over 3x minus 2. So that is how you change your subject to formula. Then we have variation. There are four different types of variation. There is um, direct variation. There is inverse variation. There is partial variation. And then there is joint variation. Now your direct variation is when your A increases with your B. Imagine you are talking about the variation between A and B. So your direct variation A is directly proportional to B. That, that means A is equal to KB. For your inverse variation A is inversely proportional to B. That means A is equal to K over B. For your joint variation A is proportional to B and another number. So you can say you can. there are two forms of joint variation. You have A is equal to K B over C, if or you can have A is equal to singular K B C. So in this case, they can both be up or one can be down. So if you have a joint variation of A with B and C, A is equal to K B over C. Then the one on top is the direct variant, and the one under is the inverse variant. Then we have partial variation when you have A is A is partially partially con um, partially uh, varies and partially constant. Sometimes you have a constant, A is equal to K, and then you have another constant, A is equal to K, um, K, let's call this next constant, um, KZ, K plus BZ. Now, basically, what this means is that A is, a is um, partially um, constant and then partially varying. So, the, any number that changes or any variable is called a variant. So, it varies with B versus constant to K. That is variation, and those are the Four basic forms, the five basic forms of the equation. Then you have simultaneous equations, graphs. So for simultaneous equations, there are two basic methods. You have the method of elimination and the method of substitution. For elimination method, you just multiply both sides by a number that will make them equal, and then you subtract the gains of them. So basically, what that means is that if you have an equation like this, three x plus two is equal to plus two y is equal to is equal to five, and then you have another one like um like um. 3x minus 2y is equal to 1. So basically, if you want to eliminate, you basically look for a number that will make them equal. So I mean, if, if this was not equal, I'll look for a number that will multiply with the 2 that will make it equal. If, it, if 1 was 3 and 1 was 2, I'll multiply the first by 2 to give 6. I'll multiply the second by 3 to give 6. So when they are equal, I'll subtract if their sign is different. 
I would add if their sign is the same, I'll subtract. For this one, I want to eliminate y, but the sign of y is different. So we have plus 2y above and we have minus 2y. So I will just add if they are different. So we have 30x plus 30x. You add the equations, that's 6x. 2y minus 2y, that's 0. And then we have 5 plus 1, that's 6. So now we have, we're dividing both sides by 6. We have x is equal to 1. So that is the method of elimination. But the method of substitution, you make the, um, your your substituent the subject of the formula. So if you want to substitute y in this case, I will make y the subject. I will say, or you want to make x the subject, I will say 3x, let 3x equals to 1 plus 2y. Dividing both sides by 3, I will have x is equal to 1 plus 2y. So it's 2y over 3. Then I will substitute that equation in the first equation. So if I if I make y if I make x, x my subject of the formula in the second equation, when I make x the subject, I'll substitute that x, the value for the x, in my first equation. And then I'll use that value to, to calculate for the second variable. That is something else equation. Then we have graphs. In your graphs, you have what you call your dependent and your independent variable. In your graph, your y is always often your dependent, and then your x is always your independent. Your dependent variable is the one that you perform numerical operations to get. While your dependent variable, your independent variable is the one that you habitually get. But now you can say when x is 1, what is y? If we have a graph of let y is equal to 3x plus 2. Now for this graph, if I, if I, if I say have x, when x is 1, when x is 2, when x is 3, I can easily plot a graph for me. When x is 1, y is 3 times 1 plus that's 5. When x is 2, y is 3 times 2, 6 plus 2, that's 8. When x is 3, 3 times 3, 9 plus 2, that's 11. So you can see that this point, if I point, if I plot this point on a graph, I'll get a series of coordinates. So then I, I could get a straight line graph, 1,5, 1,5, I'm just trying to sketch 2,8, 3, 11. So I'll get a straight line graph. And then the slope of that graph is given by the when you, de when you derive the function. So if y is equal to 3x plus c, you, de you derive, derive, derive the function. Now you can check, there's another video in this channel where we talk about derivation in detail. So you can check that video out if you don't understand the principle of derivation. But basically, in derivation, if you have y is equal to 3x plus 2, you differentiate the 3x. When you differentiate 3x, you will be power of x, x is power of x is 1. So 3 times 1. Then that's times x raised to the power 1 minus 1. Then the, the, the derivative of the constant is always 0. That's plus 0. I say that 1 is 3. Then x raised to the power 1 minus 1. x raised to the power 0 is 1. So 3 times 1, that's 3. So your, your, your um, derivative is 3. So that means the gradient of this line is 3, of the graph is 3. That's how you get the gradient of your graph. And then, other things you might be asked to do is, you plot the graph, you must be able to find the gradients at the point. So basically, gradient at the point is you when you derive it and then you have any value of x in your given in your derivative, you substitute the value of x. If we are asked to find if we have a graph of maybe we have a graph um if our graph is y is equal to two x cube plus three x squared plus 1. Now, why would, would you differentiate this? This would be dy dx is equal to 2. Then that would be 2 multiply by the power of x. That's 3. 2 times 3. 2 times 3. Then multiply by x raised to the power 3 minus 1. So that would then plus 3 times 2. Multiply, the power of x is 2. I multiply by 2. Then now I'll say times x raised to the power 2 minus 1. That's 1. Then I'll say the then we have plus 1. The derivative will be constant. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Only any number, when you differentiate a number, it gives you 0. So I have 0 here. Plus zero. Then we have dy dx is equal to 2 times 3, that's 6x. 3 minus 1, that's 2. 6x equals 2. Plus 3 times 2, that's 6. 6x, x, x, 2, 2, 2 minus 1, that's 1. That's 6x. So that's our derivative. Then if we have to find the gradient of this line, when x is 1, we just substitute the value of 1. So in the derivative, that's 6 open bracket 1 is for 2 plus 6 open bracket 1. That's 6 plus 6. Because 1 is for 2 is still 1. It's 6, it's still one. So 6 plus 6 is 12. So your derivative at that point when x is 1 is 12. So that is how you get the derivative of the graph. Now we have rational expressions and partial fractions. Now in partial fractions, when you ask to find a partial fraction, imagine you have a number. A, um, the parts, something like um, if they ask you to express um, a 
Yeah. If you have 23x plus 2 and over x plus 1, x over market, x plus 1. If the have to express this in partial fractions, you will basically say equals to a over, because you are separating the fractions, then you take the first part, a over x plus b over x plus 1. So basically, how you do that is you look at the denominator. If you have x open bracket x plus 1, you factorize your denominator and then you look for each of those parts. Now, this denominator is already factorized for us. We have x open bracket x plus 1. So that's the denominator consists of two parts. We have x and then you have open bracket x plus 1. So one of the um, partial fractions will take the x, then the other will take the x plus 1. Then next, next we multiply both sides by the denominator. So we have one multiply this by x plus 1, we'll be left with the denominator. That's a 3x plus 2. Is equal to one multiply this one by x open bracket x plus one will be left with x plus one. That's a open bracket x plus one plus one multiply this one by x plus one. We have bx. So um we um expand the um right the right hand side. That's a times x is ax plus a. B times x is bx. So we'll bring them together. The similar terms ax and bx are similar. So we have ax plus bx plus a. Then we have one factorize x as we have. A plus B, close the bracket, X plus A, is equal to 3X plus 2. Then we'll compare that to the right-hand side. 3, 3X will be A plus B, X. That means A plus B will be equal to 3. That means we'll set up an equation A plus B is equal to 3. That's equation 1. Then equation 2, we have A is equal to 2. So if A is equal to 2, your B, if A is equal to 2 and your A plus B is 3, that means your A plus B will be 2 plus B is 3. So your b is 3 minus 2 is equal to 1. That means you have you can easily substitute your values in your original equation. That means this will become your a will become 2, then your b will become 1. So simply put, that means your 3x plus 2 over x open market x plus 1 is equal to 2 over x plus 1 over x plus 1. So that is how to calculate the partial fractions. Next, we talk about inequalities. And inequalities, you inequalities, you treat inequalities simply like um like like graphs, you see, you treat inequalities like graphs. When you want to calculate an inequality, you basically turn it into an equation, and then you test for the origin. So how you do that is this. If you have an inequality like y is equal to three x plus two, sorry, and you have y is less than three x plus two, less than three x plus two, and then you have to find the inequality on the graph. So basically, what you do is test the origin, but before that, you have to test the um, the um, intercept. Now, intercept is the point on the graph where the graph meets the um, the x and y axis. So basically, if you want to find like, the y intercept, you make x is zero, and then if you want to find the x intercept, you make y zero. So to find, let's start from finding the y intercept. Let's make x is equal to zero. So we we'll, we'll first change our inequality to, our, to an equation. So y is equal to three x plus two. So we, 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 we ignore the inequality, then let's make x 0, y is equal to 3 times 0, that's 0 plus 2, so y is 0, so our, our y intercept is, is, is um, 2 comma 0, then for, to calculate our x intercept, we make y to be 0, that means x intercept, y is equal to 3x plus 2, make y 0, so when y is 0, 3x, 0 is 3x plus 2, move 2 to the, to the other side, that means minus 2 is equal to 3x. Dividing both sides by 3, we have what? Dividing both sides by 3, we have him. x is what? Minus 2 over 3. That means we have our x intercept becomes minus 2 over 3, comma 0. That's our x intercept. So next, that is how to find the graph. Then we will now plot, we will now plot the graph. And then we have the intercept. You put your intercept. Your intercept is minus 2, minus 2. So this is the minus x axis. So I will point it, then my y intercept is 2, so I'll point it. So I will draw a line between those two, and then I will not take from my origin. Now I will substitute y is and x is 0, 0, 0. When your y is 0, this is going to be 0, right? When your y is 0, this is 0. So this time around, when you are testing for the origin, you will pass back to your inequality. So you don't make it an equation anymore. So y is 0. 0 is less than 3 times 0 plus 2. So zero is lesser than two. Is zero lesser than two? So if your if your answer is correct, if zero is lesser than two, that means your origin you paint you will, you will shade the direction containing your origin. Now this direction, if we shade in this direction, upper direction does not contain the origin. But if we shade in the lower direction, it contains the origin. So you can shade the lower direction because it is true. 
So if you test for your origin and it is true, you shade the region containing your origin. And then we have quadratic graphs. So quadratic graph, you basically treat them like linear graphs. Imagine we have a graph like um, Imagine we have y is lesser than or equals to x squared plus um, plus 3x plus 2. Now for this kind of um, equation, first of all you have to change to an e equation. You change from an equality to an equation. You have, let's make it y is equals to x squared plus 3x. Two. Now you factorize. Basically, you multiply your first term and your last term, the coefficients. One, this one, one x squared. So you take the one, multiply by the two, the last term. That's one times two. That's two. So what will you multiply? What will you? What will you get? You look for two numbers that when you multiply them together, they will give you two, and when you add them together, they will give you three. So let's say should we use two times one. Two times one is two. Then two plus one is three. So when you add your two terms, it must give you the middle term. So and this gives us the middle term. So we use our terms. So we will simply add x. That will be x squared plus 2x plus x plus 2. So that's basically how you factorize. Then you factorize x out in the first two. You break it into two parts. In the first two, let's remove x. x squared divided by x, that's x. 2x divided by x, that's two, x plus 2. Then next, what is common? Look, at, look for what is common. So nothing is common. So if nothing is common, you just take 1. Take plus 1. Open your bracket. X divided by one, that's x. Two divided by one, that's that plus two. Then we have what is common again? That is x plus two is common. That's we bring the x plus two out. Then when we divide x, x one number x. Open bracket. X plus two divided by x plus two. That's x. Then x plus two divided by x plus two. That's one. So your final answer is y is equals to x plus two. Open bracket. X plus two. Close bracket. Open bracket. X plus one. Close bracket. So you have successfully factorized that. Next, we will now talk about the fact that. Um, we will now bring back our inequality. So we have um, y is lesser than or equals to. Yeah. When you have a lesser than, that means if y is lesser than or equals to, that means either let's test as y is zero. Now if y is if if um, if um, x plus two x plus one if zero is lesser than x plus two x plus one, that means that means x plus two x plus one will be greater than zero or equals to zero. So if zero is less than something, that means that thing is greater than zero. Then if the if it is greater than zero, we have x plus two is greater than or equal to zero, or x plus two x plus one is greater than or equal to zero. Because if if x plus two is greater than or equal to zero, that means x plus one is greater than or equal to zero. But if x plus two is lesser than zero, then x plus one will be lesser than zero. X plus two less than or equal to zero, or x plus one. Lesser than or equal to zero. So this, in this way, we have set up an equation whereby we have, if we have something greater than, greater than and greater than will give us greater than, lesser than and lesser than will give us, will give us lesser than. So anytime you have your your sign of your inequality pointing to the greater than sign, so that means your two solutions must be must point in the greater than or they must point in the lesser than. So then if we solve, if we have x is x is greater than or equal to minus two or x is greater than or equal to minus 1. Then we also have x is less than or equal to minus 2. Or x is less than or equal to minus 1. So that means in this equation, we will look for the one that covers all. If x is greater than or equal to minus 2, does that mean x is greater than or equal to minus 1? So you have to draw a number line. You have to draw m. Minus 1, minus 2, 0. So if x is greater than minus 2, does it mean x is greater than minus 1? It doesn't mean so. But if x is greater than minus 1, does it mean x is greater than minus 2? Yes. So that means we'll take this one. Then we'll take the opposite one in the lower side. So we have x is lesser than or equal to minus 2. Or x is greater than or equal to minus 1. So if you have to plot this, plot this on a number line, you basically, you basically put your arrow diagrams. Put your 0, minus 1, minus 2, 1, 2. Then we have um, x, is greater, x, is, x is lesser than or equal to minus 2. So you put your circle, then you shade it because there's a lesser than or equals to. So lesser than will go to the left hand side. Then x is greater than or equals to um, minus one. So that means you shade your arrow, shade your circle, then you point in the other direction. So that is all for inequalities. Then we have sequences and series. 
So your sequence and series, you have um, I will explain the sequence and series like this. So in your sequence and series, you have um, arithmetic progression and you have geometric progression. Now your arithmetic progression, every every member of your arithmetic progression, just like you are adding a number, and that number is known as your common difference. So for your arithmetic progression, if I have a progression of two, if I have an, if I have an AP of two, four, six, eight, and so on and so forth, that means you will notice that what am I adding to each number? I'm adding two to two to get four. I'm adding two to four to get six. Adding two again. So that thing I'm, I keep adding is called the common difference. If I keep adding two, my common difference D is equal to two. So, but if it's if we talk about geometric progression, GP, you are multiplying by a common ratio. But in AP, you are adding a common difference. So, and then you ask ask to um, look for the common difference. Your common difference is always uniform. So all you need to do is subtract any two subsequent any two um, um, sequential terms or any two other uh, any two adjacent terms to get the common difference. And then for your GP, all you need to do is you, is, you, is you divide any two adjacent terms to get your GP. So that is not very difficult. Then we have lines, triangles, and polynomials. So I want to talk about lines, triangles, and polynomials. So we will talk about the basic laws of lines now. So in, in lines, you have basic laws and rules regarding your lines. For your lines, you have um, we have various laws. And the first one we're talking about is vertically opposite angles. Vertically opposite angles. Anytime you have angles like this, like X angles. So the X, the angle in the first arm of the X and the angle in the second arm of the X, they are equal. So these are called vertically opposite angles. Then we have um, angles corresponding angles. When you have parallel lines and you have a transversal. So that angle at the top, at the top line, between the transversal and the top, is equal to the angle between the transversal and the bottom. So these are called corresponding angles. Then you have um, um, alternate angles, which means that the angle is formed in the hollow of a Z. So this angle is equal to this angle. You can see that this angle, this angle is equal to this angle because they are vertically opposite. This angle is equal to this angle because they are corresponding. This angle is equal to the angle because they are alternate. So those are the major rules you have to apply in mathematics, senior, secondary school, and for your jam. Um, you need to know those ones. Then you talk about triangles. There are three different types of triangles. There are equilateral triangles, there are um, accessory triangles, and there are scaling triangles. Equilateral triangles have all their sides and e angles equal, and that is each of the angles is 60 degrees. Then we have um, scaling triangle has only two sides equal, and, and then always remember that base angles of a triangle are equal. Then we have um, scaling triangle has all the sides different. So that is basically it. Then we have polynomials. Polynomials is what we've just talked about. So I've just talked about polynomials and addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And they all follow um, um, simple um, algebraic methods to um, multiply and add your polynomials. So then we have trigonometry and circles. So for circles, we have many circle theorems. And you can check those out in another video of this channel. I've talked in detail about circle theorems, but basically we have circle theorems that the, when, whenever you have a, a line drawn from the center of a circle to meet a chord, a chord is a line that joins any two points on a circle. So anytime you have a, a line from the center of a circle to meet that chord, at the center of that chord, it always bisects the chord and it always meets that right angle. Then you have this, the, um, the theorem that angles in the alternate segment of the circle are equal that is when you that's tangent when you have a tangent a tangent is a line that meets your circle at one point so the angle in its alternate segments and alternate segments are formed when you only have a chord your chord divides your circle into two parts so those that alternate segment is the that alternate angle is the angle in the other in the in opposite arms of the segment so you can check the video out for circle theorems in this channel so next we'll talk about um trigonometry we have sine cos and tan so when anytime you have a that's good. Triangle, yeah. So most of the time, trigonometry works for right angle triangle. If you are given a right angle triangle, you use sine um, um, so cartoa, which means sine is equal to so sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Tan is equal to opposite over adjacent. But if you are not given right angles, you make use of sine rule uh, or your cosine rule. So your sine rule is, is equal to sine A over side A is equal to sine. B over side B is equal to sine C over side C. So basically, if you have if, if this is your angle A, this will be your side A. If it's your angle B, this will be your side B. 
if it's your angle see this video side see so your angles and your sides they are facing each other that's how your sine rule operates then you have your cosine rule your cosine rule says that um says that um c square is equal to a square plus b square minus 2ab cos c so basically in this angle that's cos c is the, is the angle facing your side c so basically it is used to form find the um when you have two um an angle between two sides and you are looking for this the side that is facing the angle you make use of your cosine rule as you can see here so that is the basic rules for trigonometry and they are shortcuts you can master those shortcuts when you can practice your trigonometry often and often next we talk about mensuration area and volume so in mensuration area and volume the area of circle is pi r square the parameter of the circle is um, 2 pi r the um, area of the rectangle is length times breadth parameter of the rectangle is 2 open bracket length plus breadth then you have your square area of the square is s square where s is inside of the square parameter of the square is s is s plus s plus s plus s for the first side that's for s so you are required to read your books and um, understand and be able to remember all these area formulas and if possible even understand how they are gotten so that in case you forget you can easily get it just like area with trapezium is 1 over 2 open bracket a plus b close bracket h so you can easily get that from the summation of the area of the rectangle and the area of the triangle so you can work on that then we have bearing latitude and longitude which i will be explaining now so in your bearing you are usually you are you'll be asked to find the bearing of a place from another point from another, another place that is not very difficult Imagine you have your A and your B, your side A and your side B. If you have a point A and your point B, then you draw your coordinates on that point A and point B. And then when you join them together with a straight line, then they can ask you if this is A and this is B. They can ask you what is the bearing of B from A. Now the bearing of a point from another point is it is just simply the angle you need to at a clockwise angle you need to turn to get to that point. So if I'm asked to find the bearing of B from A, I will, I will calculate the angle I have to turn at the clockwise to get to the line that joins A to B. So basically if this is um, 30 degree, then my angle will become 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 30. That's 270 plus 30. That's 300 degree. So that is your, 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 your answer to your brain. But now if they ask you to find what's the bearing of A from B. So the bearing of A from B is the angle you need to turn from that of B to get to A. So if you turn anti-clockwise, if you, if you turn here, Sorry, I mean clockwise. It, 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 it's a clockwise direction. So basically, your brain is a clockwise direction. I made a mistake there, right there. So you have to turn clockwise. So if this is 30 degrees, you turn clockwise. Clockwise. 90 plus, plus, um, plus. If this one is 30, then the one, the one, the, its complement will be 60. Because complementary angles add up to 90. Then this is 90 plus 6, that's 150 for A. And then the brain of A from B will become, you turn clockwise. 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus. Then, if you want to get this other angle, you have to use alternate angles. So this one is 60. So this one will also be 60. Because of what I explained earlier, alternate angles are equal. So that means this is 60. So this is 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 60. That's 270 plus 60. That's 330 degree. So the bearing of A from B is 150. The bearing of B from A is um, 150. The bearing of A from B is 330 degree. And then your latitude and longitude, you basically need to draw a circle. And your latitude and longitude deals with your earth. So basically, latitude lines of latitude are lines that 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 run. You, have, you if you have the earth as a jerk, you have lines that run from north to south. Those lines are called your longitude. Then you have lines that that run from west to east. These, those lines are called your latitude. So each of these lines has their own degree. So your latitude lines run from your zero to your eighty one eighty. Then your longitude lines. So your latitude lines run from your 0 to your 90 degrees south. 0 degree, your equator is your 0 degree, your, 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 your south pole is your 90 degree south. Your yeah, north pole is your 90 degree, 90 degree north. But then your, your longitude, which will run from north to south, are from 0 degree to 180 east and west. So basically, anytime you are moving to a direction of east, you add your angle, you add your, um, you add time, just as in geography. Anytime you are moving east, 
to add enter me and moving where to subtract but in, in this case you basically take the angle difference you take the angle difference and you divide by um 360 and then you multiply by the circumference of the earth so basically if you have if you have two points and their latitude difference is theta so you have theta over 360 times 2 pi r so most often you'll be given the radius of the earth so and that r could be 60 6400 or any value you are given so you you substitute in your your, your equation and then you take your pi to 20 over 7 then you, then you calculate but in in some other cases when you are given when you are not on the equator in in case of latitude when you want to calculate the circumference of a latitude you make use of a, the radius of latitude and the radius of latitude because the radius of the earth times the cos of the angle of latitude because theta cos alpha sorry so now if this is latitude latitude 45 degree then the radius of the radius of this latitude will become r cos 45 that's simply what you need to know and then for more integrate, integrated calculations you can easily make use of these fundamentals to to further your knowledge so then we have construction of loci so in some current video i'll be talking about various construction me methods and techniques so but basically when you want to bisect a lines that's the construction technique then you have um, um, um draw an angle 90 angle 60 so this can also come out in your general examination you'll be able to know the fundamentals so basically when you want to bisect a lines there are techniques which we'll be talking about next we'll talk about statistic and probability statistic and probability involves your mean your median your mood and you have your standard deviation you have your um, 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 variance and all the rest now your mean your mean is the one is x bar and it's called your summation of summation of um summation of frequency times your um, x over summation of frequency so your mean is efx over ef so your mean is also known as your sum of things over number of things then your median is basically the middle number so if you have a distribution of 10 numbers your median your, your median will be the so the, will be the multiplication of the middle which is the fifth and the, the the number after the middle which is the sixth so if you have even numbers your median will be equal to if you have 10 numbers 10 is even right now you divide that 10 by 2 that's 5 so you are your median will become your fifth plus your sixth number over two you find the average of your fifth and sixth number if you have 12 numbers your median will be your six plus your seven over two if you have eight numbers you have your, your median will be your fourth number plus your fifth number over two that's it. then you have your mode your mode is basically the number or your district of your distribution that occurs the, the the greatest amount of times that's your mode then you have your standard deviation your standard deviation sd is given as is this is the square root of your variance and your variance is equal to your um summation f x minus x bar over summation f so basically your your standard deviation is the summation of your frequency times your deviation from the mean that is why it's called the standard deviation then you divide by your Summation of frequency and summation of frequency is your number of distribution. So that is your variance. Then you have your mean, uh, mean deviation that is equal to it has no square root. So that is summation f times the absolute value of your x minus x bar. That is the, the absolute value of deviation from your mean over the total number of things you are considering in your distribution. Then we we'll also talk about miscellaneous other topics in videos and these extra topics which you might need to know for your mathematics exam. We involve binary operation, differentiation, integration, matrices, matrices, determinants, and coordinate geometry. So those are additional topics you will need to know, and those are further math topics, which will also be covered in a further video of this topic. But this is meant to be a total guide, a complete guide, and a um, summary of your jump examination.